Hello, Society members and viewers from around the world. My name is Charles Knippen. I am the president of the National Society of Leadership and Success. And today, I'm happy to be hosting another Thought Leader series with you. In our Thought Leader series, we like to give our viewers the opportunity to hear um, the stories, the background, the insights from leaders from around the world. And today we are sitting with Mayor Savante Myrick of Ithaca, New York. At the age of 24, Savante became the youngest mayor in the state of New York history. And today we're going to be hearing his story and hearing his insights. Mayor Myrick, thank you for being with us here today. Thank you very much. It's my pleasure. Great. Every Thought Leader series, we want to start out with getting your story. In many interviews, they'll ask you the pointed questions and they'll forget about the history. Mm. And I want to start going back before your second re-election, before mm. your first election, mm. before your time at Cornell, before your nearly perfect SAT score. Yeah. <laughs> I want to go back all the way to your youth. And I want to ask you, what's the path that got you to where you are today? Thank you. I appreciate that. And, uh, and I appreciate, too, you mentioning my SAT scores. Uh, <laughs> a, a point of great frustration is that they don't tell you what question you got wrong. And uh, <laughs> I've written many letters and they never let me know. <laughs> I appreciate that question because where I came from is important to me and I think has determined where I am now. You know, I was born in 1987 in a time in this country when uh, the drug epidemic was at its peak, particularly crack, particularly for um, black Americans in inner cities. And for a decade, our country had been ignoring the problem. The answer had been to ratchet up penalties to arrest more people, but not to get them the treatment they needed. And my father was an addict. I mean, he was a victim of this epidemic. And, and that matters for who I became in so many ways. I mean, what it meant was that we would, my mother would, have to raise the four of us alone. You know, the man that she met and loved and married became somebody else. And that's hard. It's a hard thing. So we were very poor, you know, we had spent actually the first six months of my life in a homeless shelter. And for the first eight years, we were in and out of homelessness. We were never quite uh, housing secure, but she worked very hard. I watched her work two or three minimum wage jobs. And, you know, I watched my grandparents sacrifice uh, quite a lot. They were retired school teachers and they had a pension and they didn't have a lot, but they had enough to feed us when we were hungry and uh, to make sure we had new sneakers so that we could go to school uh, in the beginning of the year. And I got so much support from that school, from public school teachers and a system that made sure that we were fed because they knew that we couldn't focus on our algebra homework if we were too worried about the rumble in our stomachs. I mean, all of that informed not just the person that I'd become, but the policies that I believed in. So from a very young age, I was interested in government. And I thought that journalism, the people who covered politics, was going to be the closest I could ever get to this thing that meant so much to me. Mm -hmm. So I came to Cornell to study communication. Mm -hmm. uh, I tried writing for the Cornell Daily Sun. That didn't really work for them or for me. Turned out I was too opinionated to sit at a meeting <laughs> and not say my opinion. I was also too poor a writer <laughs> mm -hmm. to cut it. But in my involvement downtown as I got more engaged in the city. I met people who encouraged me to run in my junior year when I was 20 years old. I ran for the city council. I was elected and sworn in and my true education began. I mean, the battles in that room, the coded language, the <laughs> procedure, the learning what it took outside of the classroom to actually get something done. Learning that the world is not a meritocracy like school, that you can't just hand in a paper that has in all the facts and get an A plus, that you have to actually compromise, mm -hmm. that you have to inspire, that you have to motivate, sometimes that you have to beat <laughs> the opposition. <laughs> Those four years in that chamber taught me quite a lot. So I ran for mayor when I was 24. I had a, a three-way primary and then a four-way general election. It's one of the most difficult things I ever did, but I knocked on every door in the city two and a half times. Uh, we had volunteers who knocked on every door in the city 14 times. Wow. And, and I was able to win 18 out of 18 election districts, which felt good. Well, I thought that was a good result until <laughs> last month when I was reelected with 89% of the vote. But leading the city over the last, this is now my ninth year in office, oh, wow. has been uh, 
you know, it's a third of my life. Wow. A third of my life I've spent working for the people of Ithaca, and I couldn't be happier. I feel like I am working out my values, which is a nice thing. You know, a lot of people go to work and then have to find time after work or on the weekends to express themselves. Mm -hmm. Join a pottery club or, or, or volunteer at the soup kitchen. I don't have pets. I don't have hobbies. <laughs> I don't have, uh, you know, a life, really, basically. <laughs> and uh, it's like every one of my interests wrapped up in, in this one thing. Mm -hmm. And so I feel blessed. And I've learned a lot. You were reelected, and you know you are out there daily, mm -hmm. you know, working to affect change here in the Ithaca community. In those endeavors, mm -hmm. you're dealing with a lot of different people, mm -hmm. and so <laughs> yes, very different <laughs> in some cases. Yes, and so you know that's one of the things that we teach our leaders mm -hmm. that in our program uh, we are telling them you have to understand your communication style, but more importantly, you have to understand other people's communication styles, and mm -hmm. it's not about them bending to you. It's about you flexing your style to communicate with them. Yeah. And so as you're going you know, through this process, you're working with your constituents, you're working mm -hmm. with the people here in the government, what has been your experience in having mm -hmm. to bend your style? Uh -huh. And you know, what suggestions would you give to our students and how that actually works out in the real world? Yeah, huge, huge learning curve for me. When I came on the city council, I thought, finally, this is my opportunity to have my way. I'm going to treat this like I do school, you know? I'm going to write the best paper, I'm going to write the best speech, I'm going to walk into the chamber, and when I lay all these facts on them, I'll win the vote, 10 to 1, 10 to 0. Sure enough, I was losing 9 to 1, 9 to 1, 9 to 1 all the time. Because I was talking about what convinced me, what motivated me. Mm -hmm. Instead of figuring out the people that I worked with, figuring out what motivated them, the areas in which their interest and my interest overlap, and then getting things done in the center of that Venn diagram. Mm -hmm. What I started to do when I took office was I have dinner with every one of my city council people every month. Right, so there's 10 of them. And this gives us a chance to talk about what's important in their neighborhood, what they're hearing, gives them a chance to hear about what I'm working on. And it gives us a chance to do all that outside of the cameras where politicking takes over. What that means is that I understand what they care about long before I even draft or craft a proposal to send to them. So I can work their values into what I'm proposing, and then when I send it to a committee, what you have to, what I have to consistently remind myself is that these are my ideas, but they're not my babies. And that <laughs> if they are changed by other people, particularly by a majority of the 10 folks who were elected by mm -hmm. their neighbors, then the change is probably for the better. Mm -hmm. Even if I don't see it, even if I don't understand it, mm -hmm. I just trust that the change is for the better. That kind of leadership is difficult in the short term. You feel like you are not getting enough credit. It doesn't stroke your ego <laughs> having 10 people pull apart your idea and put it back together. But in the long run, you and your whole team get tremendous credit because things are actually working. As you're looking into what you want to accomplish now that you're in your second term, congratulations yeah. by the way. Thank you. You look at it and you say, you know, most people would call that goals. Yeah. And yeah. so, you know, we look at what goals are for your administration, mm -hmm. what you want to accomplish, but I want to take a step back. Mm. And I want to say, when you had mentioned during your story, you had said, I didn't even know I was going to be in government. Yeah. When did goals start playing a role in uh, your life? And how did they play a role in your life? And mm. how are they impacting you now? I think I was always goal-oriented. But my goals weren't always positive, <laughs> and they weren't always long term, you know? I was always very competitive. Mm -hmm. So a goal that would pop up time and again is to win. I would want to win. And that meant that when we were learning to read and we had the little picture books that would, and you'd start with book one and then you get to book two, I had to finish before anybody else in the class, and I had to get it done first. Was that positive? Probably not. I mean, it was it healthy? <laughs> Probably not. You know, I wasn't learning for the love of learning. I was trying to beat, you know, Michelle Harris, who I never could. She would always be faster. <laughs> I let myself be ruled by short-term goals instead of long-term goals. And a short-term goal was to make enough money at work so that I could have fun that weekend, mm -hmm. or to earn enough money that that I could buy a car. Instead of thinking <laughs> about who I wanted to impact and how I wanted to get there. Mm. My goals are as broad as possible now. 
um, short-term goals, and by short-term goals I mean even one year, two year, five year plans, it can get ridiculous pretty quick. I, I could tell you what my five year plans were at every year of my life. Not a single one of them has been remotely accurate. <laughs> I mean, they've all been so wrong about yep. where I was going and why I was going there. So when I wake up in the morning as mayor, if I find that my goal is to pass a certain piece of legislation by February, mm -hmm. then between now and February, I find that my life is very difficult, very stressful, and I end up twisting myself in knots and doing weird things in order to get that legislation passed. But if instead I wake up and I tell myself, my goal is to make sure that there are fewer families living in fear and living in despair in my city. It changes the day. It changes the way you spend your time. You know what it does? It takes the ego out of the whole picture. Because instead of saying, well, I need my legislation to pass in the form that I wrote it, and I need it to pass in the timeline that I set out so that I can tell people I passed this legislation by February, mm -hmm. you'll burn yourself out that way. I mean, not only is it unproductive, it's unhealthy. But if instead you say, uh, when, when a hiccup comes up, council person proposes an amendment, instead of thinking about, they're changing my legislation. To achieve my goal, that was supposed to be passed by February and it's supposed to look this way. Instead, if you ask yourself, will this help me get closer to this long-term goal? But you have to be specific. Mm -hmm. I mean, you have to be specific. You have to, to know what your long-range goal is like what does it mean what is it what, what do you want to do if you don't remember and write that goal down mm -hmm. and then take steps towards achieving it biggest lesson i learned is that unless you share your goals and unless you're explicit about them unless you write them down they're not going to happen mm -hmm. when i ran for mayor i was whipped into a frenzy i i set all these goals i wrote them down when i wanted to run for the city council and it became my platform these were the things i wanted to do it was just four things then and i'd done them I've done them all after two years in office. So I was considering running for re-election, and I made another list of goals. This list was much longer, because I'd spent time inside City Hall. But this list was too big for any city council person. It was a, a mayor's list. Mm -hmm. So I sort of whipped myself into a frenzy, and in a moment of delusion, decided I was going to run for mayor. <laughs> in that moment, while that frenzy was on me. I called everybody on the city council and told them what I wanted to do. I called my friends, I called my family, I told them I was going to run for mayor. I asked them for their donations and for their help and their support. Many of them said yes. And I'm glad I did that because two days later I decided I did not want to run for mayor. Oh my gosh. <laughs> I decided it was too scary <laughs> and I, I was too young and that I would never get the votes, right? But because I had already committed myself by speaking my goals out loud mm -hmm. by putting them in paper, by asking other people to help me, I couldn't just walk away. Yep. And oftentimes in my life I've set a goal, hit it from the world, and then two days later gotten too scared about it. And when that happens, it's too easy. Mm -hmm. It's too easy to let it go, mm -hmm. to let it drop. So now when I have an idea, when I have a goal and I'm in office, I share it with as many people as possible. First, because if it's a bad idea, they'll let you know, <laughs> uh, and you can stop wasting your time on it. Uh, but second, because it commits you. Yeah, let's dive into that a little bit more because sure. I think for a lot of people, they've experienced the same thing you did, where yeah. they made it, they made an announcement, they yeah. made a decision, all of a sudden they go that self doubt. Yes. All of a sudden, just creeps in. Sure. You know, so beyond just you know vocalizing it, mm -hmm. what else has worked for you as far as overcoming that self doubt, that voice in the back of a lot of people's oh, heads that yeah. says you can't do that? Oh yeah. That is your worst enemy. Mm. I mean, there is nobody out there that's trying to stop you. And there's nobody who's trying to stop you as hard as you are trying to stop yourself. Fear and the fear of failure is, as a leader, your largest challenge. Mm -hmm. And I try and use the tool of perspective. I mean, so many of us don't do the things we want to do because we're scared. We don't run for office. We don't apply for that job. We don't walk into the interview. We don't ask the girl out. We don't ask the guy out because we are afraid they will say no. We won't make the team. We won't make the cut. We'll fail. Mm -hmm. And you will a lot. I fail all the time. I mean, it's, you know, I've <laughs> failed three <laughs> times today already. It, you will fail. And your past failures can become a tool to help you overcome future obstacles. Mm -hmm. So. 
it's not just that you learn lessons from past failures, because you do. You know, you go left, you hit a wall, shouldn't have done that, go right next time, right? right? But they also give you the strength you need, the perspective. Yep. If you will think back to your first time somebody broke up with you, how devastating. Mm -hmm. I mean, hide under your bed, drop out of school, change your identity, devastating it is. And you think about it now, and, it, and, and you realize, when was the last time you even thought of that person, mm -hmm. right? It's been years, and you're not living under your bed anymore. Think of the time that you really messed up at work. I mean, you started to sweat because you realized how much you'd messed up. And here you are still. Maybe it's not at that job anymore. Mm -hmm. <laughs> yeah. but, but you're still alive. You know, you are still uh, moving forward. The time you did get cut from the team, the time you didn't get the job, the time you didn't get into that college, but here you are still standing. Mm -hmm. Your past failures are not total. Yeah. That means your present failures won't be total either. Yeah. So going for them means what? You know, just another, just another notch in the belt. <laughs> 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 and, and that trick helps me. Yeah. Perspective from my own failures, I also find perspective in other people, in both their successes and failures. Often thinking of people, I think this is one of the things that people find so inspiring about someone like a Steve Jobs. It's not just that he did remarkable things. I mean, a lot of people do remarkable things. But the fact that he had done remarkable things and then failed miserably mm -hmm. and then came back and did more remarkable things. Absolutely. That is a story that people need to hear. Yeah. And I think it's a story we all have to tell ourselves. You know, there's a saying there, you are the sum total of the people that you surround yourself so with. So. And so, you know, we heard a little bit about your mm -hmm. Hall of Justice. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so yeah. can you tell us about what the Hall of Justice is, you know, why the Hall of Justice and yeah. what it means to you? I believe that very much. There's an American Indian proverb that says, show me who you walk with and I'll show you who you are. Mm -hmm. you know? And uh, I work, walk with a very nerdy crew. <laughs> 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 Myself and another city councilman at the time and a county legislator and, and a couple PhD students. We uh, had this big house that we called, again, this is the nerd, <laughs> mm -hmm. <laughs> and it's coming out. If you ever watch the old cartoons of yeah. Batman and Superman and Wonder Woman. Some of my favorite. Yeah, right? And they'd cut, to, <laughs> they'd cut to, you know, you'd see what Lex Luthor was planning. Yep. But then they'd cut back to meanwhile at the, mm -hmm. at the Hall of Justice. Absolutely. <laughs> so, you know, we called ourselves that. And I heard that one of your favorite characters was Superman. That's right. Well, yes. I don't think we would, we had to show up with something oh, you're for kidding. you. So we wanted no to say way. thank you. Oh my gosh. <laughs> <laughs> Oh my gosh, that's very sweet of you. Thank you very much. I've always yeah. been a, a big fan. That's, that's fantastic. And I think you're doing a great job of being Thanks. Superman for the city of Ithaca. <laughs> and, you know, we look forward to seeing what you're going to be doing in the future, whether Thank that is know. here or whether that's nationwide or globally. From here, we want to encourage you to check out the other interviews for our Thought Leaders series on the National Society of Leadership and Success website. We wish you all the best in your continued journey towards your success.